<laughs> okay. All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Lucy Bullivant. I'm one of the trustees for Temple Bar Trust. And since July 2020, I've curated the Trust's popular online series of talks. You can see the wealth of talk videos and films that we've created to date, as well as details of our future events, talks, walks, and films on the Trust's website, templebartrust.org. Temple Bar Trust promotes architecture, urban and landscape design in the Square Mile in London to a wide public through a regular programme of talks and tours. And equally important to us is our active support for greater diversity in the architecture and built environment professions, which we address through both our talk series and other related educational activities. So it will be amazing to finally return to live events, uh, we hope in some point later in July, at our home Temple Bar on, Temple, uh, on uh, Paternoster Square. And we will be announcing our launch date and exciting events for the Temple Bar soon. And I'm happy to say we will continue to include live streaming of talks to ensure that they're fully accessible across all members of our audience. So Temple Bar, the architectural gateway to the city designed by Sir Christopher Wren and managed today by the Trust, is also home to our associated worshipful company of chartered architects, of which I am a liveryman. Yes, indeed, a liveryman. Um, and we really look forward to activating the space for in-person events, meetings, dining and entertainment and you'll have the opportunity to book our centre for your own events as well. So I'm not, I am delighted tonight to welcome our two speakers, Jonathan Ben Shaw and Mykola uh, Nab Naboka. Hello to both of you, very much um, Hello. looking forward to your talk. Hi. 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 Um, thank you so much both very much for joining us. My co Mikola from um, Lviv in Ukraine. We are really, truly honored to have you both with us tonight. So Jonathan Benshaw is a theater and movement director from London. And Mikola is, uh, in Boca is an actor and a cultural manager from Kharkiv in Ukraine. The title of their talk is Kharkiv Residency Slovo, Art and Architecture Under Fire in Ukraine. It takes place uh, at a pivotal moment for all of those you have read the newspapers, seen the media, when it seems that Russia is in retreat from the city, which is Ukraine's second largest, although uh, there is a bom bombing in villages uh, six miles to the north and, uh, and uh, many, many other hugely serious uh, issues. So there's clearly an awful lot to unpack in our talk. So firstly, before I, we do, uh, proceed to that. Some brief biographical highlights about each of our speakers. Jonathan studied at the University of Cambridge and at the L'Ecole Internationale de Théâtre, Jacques Lecoq, um, uh, 2019 to 21, and he was Kharkiv Residency Slovo's first international resident. We will explain what exactly this um, multidisciplinary residency is in a very short while. And during his two month, st two month stay in Kharkiv, he taught mu movement and made the film that's the subject of our talk tonight, What Shall We Do With These Buildings? Last Autumn, which is a documentary dance film exploring the legacy of Soviet architecture in Kharkiv. Now he runs community arts engagement projects in Peterborough and in Burgundy in France. And Mikola studied also uh, at the L'Ecole, same Mikola, same time. And after finishing his studies, he returned to Ukraine where he helped organize the Slovo residency, Kharkiv, and taught movement at the Kharkiv School of Architecture. Really interesting, cross fertilization. He produced and performed in the uh, What Shall I Do with His Buildings film. And since the invasion, he has fled to Lviv where he continues to work. So we're focusing on this film and the exceptional ways in which it explores the city's unique cultural context, benefiting from a major cultural revival as it did in the period 2014 to 22, and how this came to an abrupt end when Russia invaded Ukraine, a war that changed the world forever. 
Consequently, the film's examination of the subtler cultural memory of Russian domination in Kharkiv, it's taken on a new meaning. And as our speakers will underline, it serves as a really uh, a real snapshot of an independent, hopeful Ukraine trying to find its feet at a time when that independence has never been more fragile. So through this talk, we are going to be, we are going to be engaging with and will extend understanding of a, a number of um, profound intersecting cultural, social and political issues that the film raises. So we equally, we wish to support Jonathan and Mikola in their continued efforts to raise money to help um, uh, uh, the whole uh, scenario. And there are two charities. So there's Help Kharkiv, a group of volunteers who provide humanitarian aid and help evacuate civilians from Kharkiv, where the film was shot, um, as a number of independent film venues in the UK and Reba and the Bartlett School of Architecture have already done through screenings and talks and King's College will be also shortly. The funds continue to be very badly needed and we ask you to respond to our combined request to make a donation to support directly through the Help Harkiv website and Jonathan and uh, Mikola will explain uh, the alternative way you can do that. We're also very keen for donations to the multidisciplinary Kharkiv uh, residency Slovo in order to support funding for the cross-cultural team to resume work uh, in Ukraine and in Kharkiv when it's safe to do so. So as we always do before our speakers present, a request to please put your questions to them in the chat box together with your name and we'll engage with them a bit later after after their talk we're really looking forward to it thank you very much and over to you jonathan and mikola thank you so much lucy for that warm welcome and thank you all for tuning in uh today or if you're watching it afterwards uh, thank you for watching uh it's my great pleasure to, to talk to you today uh, and to talk to you a little bit about uh, the Residency Slovo uh, and the film. Um, so I'll just give a broad overview of what we're going to talk about and then I'll hand over to Mikula. Um, so I'm going to, Mikula's going to talk a little bit about um, the residency, about the cultural context in which the resi residency was founded. Um, he's then going to pass over to me. I'll talk a little bit about my own experience there um, as an outsider, I guess, uh, coming into this beautiful city. We'll then play the trailer of the film. Um, unfortunately, we're unable to sort of live stream the film as much as we'd like to. Um, but we're very grateful that we were able to present a small little peek into the film. However, you can catch a screening of it at KCL on the 30th of May. Uh, so without further ado, let me pass over to Mikola, who's going to talk to us a little bit about the residency and about its cultural contexts. Uh, yeah, hello everyone and thanks for being with us. And I will, yeah, to begin with, I will talk about the residency as a project because you've heard of it, uh, heard about it for 10 times now. So mm -hmm. I'll just explain what it is and how it functions and why is it important and how it's linked to the film. So technically the residency is, um, is a cultural project that was formed in January, 2021. So it's relatively young with the intention to support and popularize Ukrainian culture uh, within Ukraine and all over the world um, with a dream of making Kharkiv one of the cultural capitals of Eastern Europe. And the way we chose to do that is by using two apartments that I'm going to talk about in a minute uh, as a places of hosting uh, residents, uh, people of art, uh, people who mainly work with text, uh, writers, poets, um, literary critics, but also uh, not limited to those. So people who, like Jonathan, for instance, work with in theatre domain, um, and um, to essentially give them an opportunity to come to Kharkiv, to live in one of these memorial apartments, and to work uh, to create the the piece of art, or to develop their research, or to dig deeper into whatever they're interested in. And this is again not limited to uh, people from Ukraine. Uh, we are inviting, uh, we were inviting before the full-scale Russian invasion, um, technically everyone who might be interested in such, um, uh, uh, such an opportunity. And um, to, to make it work, 
uh, we had a whole team or we still have a whole team of uh, people uh, who were helping these residents to uh, produce that work. Um, in fact, it was a team of 12 people. And uh, our mission, our goal was to, uh, to make this residence as comfortable and as uh, uh, um, custom made for a particular resident as possible. Um, so uh, in fact, uh, to sum up the residency attempts to provide all the necessary conditions for an artist to create or execute uh, any type of research work that is related to Kharkiv. So all of this work uh, in one way or another had to, to be about Kharkiv or had to somehow um, develop uh, some of the, dig down uh, into some of the issues uh, related to Kharkiv or the society or the ideology or um, any other problem that uh, we were facing. So right now, uh, obviously we cannot uh, function. Uh, so everything that I'm explaining is how it was before the February 24th. Um, and uh, in order to do that, uh, we, we used two memorial apartments. Um, one of them is uh, located in the house of Slovo, which I'll talk about in a minute as well. And another one is uh, apartment of Yuri Shevelov, who we'll talk about right now. Um, so um, before I do that, uh, I would like to mention that not, not only that these two apartments were renovated and uh, adapted for living, because they were memorial apartments and they had to be reconstructed uh, for that purpose, but also um, they were adapted for holding public events and um, um, uh, larger sort of gatherings of people um, to, to make it possible not only for a resident to, to live there and work individually, but also to um, interact with the society and with the community. And uh, both of these apartments have incredible stories behind them. Uh, I'd like to, to share with you a story of Yuri Shevelov, uh, who this apartment that you can see right now belongs to. Um, so Yuri Shevelov uh, was, was a linguist, an essayist, um, a literary and theater critic, and a historian of Ukrainian language, who wasn't born in Ukraine. However, he spent his childhood and he lived for almost 30 years in this apartment, which is located technically in the city center of Kharkiv. Uh, Yuri Shevelov taught at Harvard University. At some, at some point, he was uh, also a longtime professor of Slavic philology uh, at Columbia University. And um, he, he's incredibly important for the Ukrainian culture and in particular uh, to Ukrainian language because, um, in fact, he re re revolutionized the way we think about Ukrainian language today. As you may know that Ukraine, uh, unfortunately, still faces the issue of self-identification. And very often you can, um, you can hear this notion that in Ukraine people speak Russian or that uh, Ukrainian is some kind of uh, accent of Russian language or something like that. So that's, that's a direct influence of Russian propaganda and attempts, offensive attempts to occupy Ukraine for centuries. And Yuri Shevelov. Um, in fact, uh, made a critical study in which uh, he has shown that this is not the case. So to explain in a little bit more detail, um, in the Soviet Union, there was this famous notion of so-called East Slavic language, uh, which, according to Russians, was uh, technically a starting point for Ukrainian and Belarusian and Russian language to evolve from, as if there was this East Slavic a uh, very old kind of language that Russians always call Russian. And then from that language, uh, Ukrainian and Belarusian evolved later on. Uh, this is a common belief in Soviet, Ukra in Soviet Ukraine and Soviet Union in general. And uh, this message is still often used by, by Russian propaganda today in, in this war as well that we can all witness. Um, in attempt to, again, say that Ukrainian and Belarusian languages don't, in fact, they don't really exist. This is some kind of uh, um, you know, a, a tale. Um, and uh, in fact, they're just playing around by pretending that they're not 
uh, that, they're, that they're not Russians, that they're not us. In fact, they're us, they just forgot that they are us. Um, and Yuri Shavilov in his study, he has shown that these three languages, they have, they have evolved uh, independently from one another. Uh, and um, back then it was taken, uh, 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 it was taken very aggressively by, by the Soviet uh, uh, society and Soviet community of, uh, of literary critics. Uh, however, he proved that this is not the case and, um, uh, and made this uh, very important contribution to our understanding of Ukrainian language today. And this is also super important for Kharkiv because Kharkiv is mainly a Russian speaking city. Uh, so even now, uh, like be before the full scale Russian invasion, when the tension was really high and it would seem like people should probably change into speaking Ukrainian because this is a, not only a question of who they think they are, but it's also a question of their safety. But no, Kharkiv re remained 95% or more Russian speaking city. So uh, Yuri Shevelov uh, became a symbol of, um, uh, of Ukrainian culture uh, or Ukrainian language uh, in, in this Russian sort of East Ukrainian um, part of the city part of the country sorry um that is why it's super important for us to have uh the, his apartment as one of the places for the residency uh and the second uh the second apartment is uh, no less interesting so it, it, in fact it's a very it's a touching story and it's a remarkable story i'm um i think one day we'll see incredible films about this uh once we win the war uh, it's a story about House of Slovo. Uh, so House of Slovo, uh, Slovo meaning word uh, in uh, Ukrainian and Russian Slovo means word. And it begins with the letter S or in Ukrainian, you would write it as C in English. So uh, uh, that, that's why uh, it's called Slovo. Uh, I will come back to it later. That might be a bit confusing, but I'll come back to it later and you will you will understand why, why I'm making a point like that. Uh, so technically, House of Slova was a co-living space created in 1920s, uh, which was designed for Ukrainian writers and poets to live and create in one house of 66 apartments. Uh, and uh, technically, its story begins in 1917 with the Bolshevist Revolution, when the Soviets took over uh, and the Russian Empire was was over and um, uh, the Russian Empire has fallen and the Ukrainian in intelligentsia tried to use this chance in order to establish Ukrainian rule in Ukraine because for centuries Ukraine was one way or another occupied by Russian Empire and then all of a sudden Russian Empire is over this uh, huge force of Soviet something is not very clear to anyone uh, it is trying to get rid of any sort of Russian imperialistic uh, uh, left behind, so leftovers. So I'm not quite sure how to say. So this change of power in Russia began, and Ukraine uses that chance in order to, to try and to become independent. And uh, um, so Ukrainian government is st starting to fall to form itself. And it was a time of a total chaos because no one really knew what's going on and what this Soviet, what Lenin and who, he, who Lenin is and why, why is, he, is he a good guy, is he a bad guy? Should we listen to him? Should we not listen to him? Um, and uh, uh, obviously, uh, Soviet power tried to occupy as much uh, territory as possible and to, to impose its rule as far as possible. And Ukraine was very important strategically. Um, but it, uh, Soviet uh, Soviet army was still too weak in order to to just directly take over. Uh, so um, at, uh, the the newly formed Soviet regime was trying to establish itself. However, uh, it it didn't have the means yet. And uh, this is the time. This is the point in time where Lenin comes up with a very clever strategy. Technically, he decides to, instead of trying to resist the pro-Ukrainian movement in Ukraine, he says, okay, in fact, I will help you be more Ukrainian. I will, uh, yes, do everything in Ukrainian. You are 
prohibited to 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 have Ukrainian schools. You were prohibited to speak Ukrainian. You were prohibited to have Ukrainian literature develop. Now do it all. I will. Soviet power is with you. So, Soviet Ukraine is the future of uh, of Ukraine. We will be with you, and we will help you develop the country. Uh, however, it was uh, it was it was a trap because uh, technically it was an attempt to make the Soviet regime more palatable to the Ukrainian people and to 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 form trust uh, in this new Soviet rule. And this uh, strategy was called Ukrainization or in Ukrainian Ukrainization when um, uh, uh, when all of a sudden, in all of the domains of Ukrainian culture and eco economy and uh, uh, education, uh, Ukraine started flourishing and developing, and it, it started gaining this very uh, uh, um, authentic Ukrainian um, uh, uh, sort of uh, points that were that were unique to Ukraine. Uh, incredible texts were appearing. Uh, lots of talents were uh, flourishing. Uh, communities, new communities were forming, new architecture. Uh, so uh, at that time, also, it's very important to 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 know that at that time, Kharkiv became a capital of Soviet Ukraine. So it was also uh, pulling all of the resources, all of the talents, and uh, uh, you may know, you may have, you might have heard of the building called the Dershprom. Uh, which is a unique phenomenon of the modernist architecture, which was built at that time. Um, so it started uh, its construction in 1925, and uh, uh, it, was, it was finished by the end of 20s. Uh, also, another example is the Kharkiv tractor plant, uh, which, is, which you can see right now, uh, which is a centerpiece of Stalin's five, uh, first five-year plan for Soviet industrialization. Um, and these are just a few examples of that um, very, very fast, uh, incredibly uh, innovative and experimental time. Uh, universities, schools, theaters, cultural centers, uh, everything was developing and flourishing. And one of such Kharkiv sprouts was House of Slovo, which I mentioned before. And uh, if you remember me explaining what Slovo means, so Slovo means a word, uh, which starts in Ukrainian with the letter C, and C is the uh, shape of the house itself. Um, and um, uh, as I said, it was an implemented Soviet dream of communal housing uh, for writers, poets, and theater makers. Um, uh, and its form uh, uh, symb symbolized that. So uh, the name uh, House of Slovo, meaning that it's a house of word where people work with word. Um, it, and it was a very bright idea, bright Soviet idea of special housing for like-minded people, like-minded intellectuals uh, with 66 apartments. That's a huge apartment block who could live together and collaborate and create. Uh, there was even, a, and it was very uh, uh, modern at that time. So there was a special tanning area designed on the rooftop of that house. Uh, the residents of that house had their own uh, specially organized kindergarten for them. A building uh, uh, of an, no, there was no kind of that building uh, of such a project anywhere else, uh, and. Uh, there was also uh, they also when uh, when I was reading the biographies of, of uh, uh, the memories of memoirs of uh, people who lived there, they were mentioning that each apartment had a stationary phone, which was also a luxury at that point. Uh, and since Kharkiv was the capital of Soviet Ukraine, it meant that Ukraine culture, Ukrainian culture, and um, um, sorry, uh, since uh, since Kharkiv was the capital of Soviet Ukraine at that point in time, uh, it meant that the prominent Ukrainian artists moved to the city from all over the country. Uh, no matter where they were, they all wanted to be in Kharkiv, and the best of the best wanted to be in House of Slovo. Uh, this included Ukrainian theater director Les Kurbas, uh, Ukrainian writers Mykola Khvilovy, Mykola Kulish, Ostap Vishnya, Val Valerian Pidmohilny, uh, poets Vladimir Sasura and Mike Johansson, 
a journalist, uh, Petrolisovi, who uh, in whose apartment the, the residency is located, uh, and many other stars of Ukrainian culture at that time. And by saying stars, I actually mean that they were stars. They were those who were forming the uh, the opinion of many. Uh, they 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 were. Uh, they were very well paid and they were published a lot. Uh, they were taken for stars. And in a few years, uh, the inhabitants, only, only in a few years, the inhabitants would realize, in fact, that the phones are listened to by the Soviet intelligence services and that, uh, in fact, it's very useful to have all of the prominent Ukrainian artists under one rooftop. Uh, and right now, for instance, on your screen, you can see one of the scenographies to one of the plays of Reis Kurbas in Kharkiv. Um, so this generation of writers and poets have revolutionized Ukrainian culture. They didn't have much time. However, they completely changed the way we think about Ukrainian culture today. It's been 100 years, and technically in four or five years, they've done more than we could in the next uh, 90 years. And the narrative of independent Ukraine at that time became as powerful as never before. And by this point in time, Soviet rule gained a total control of the political and cultural life. Uh, it was no longer interested in Ukrainian culture as something that could sort of uh, give them more, uh, um, more points amongst the public as something that needed to be implemented in order to gain trust. Trust was already there. They had total control, and uh, the, at the same time, the culture that was created in those four or five years, uh, Ukrainian texts, Ukrainian theater plays, uh, Ukrainian art in general, it started being very endangering for Russian culture, for Russian language. And uh, as a matter of fact, by the end of 1933, so in three years, in three, four years, uh, 33 writers, poets, and theater makers who lived in this house were executed. Five were sentenced to long-term imprisonment. One committed suicide, one killed under unclear circumstances. They, they had only three, four years to live in this dream. Um, and then it was over because it was a Ukrainian dream and they had no right to do that in Soviet Ukraine. Um, overall, the wave of repressions hit 40 out of 66 apartments in Slovo House. So you can imagine the scale of repressions. And uh, today, uh, our team of residents, Slovo, yeah, so uh, this is the, um, you can see right now, this is the how House of Slovo looked like before the 24th of February. And the next is, yeah, this is how it looks right, right now. Um, so, even though it's been 100 years, but the Russians are not, they just cannot let us be. They keep on trying to destroy what makes us us. Because that's endangering Russian rule. That's endangering the Russian plans of uh, returning into this notion of Russian empire and controlling everything around. Because we want to be us, they are killing us. Um, and... Um, yeah, to sum up, uh, the residency Slovo team is not leaving Ukraine. All of us are here. Uh, some of us, uh, like a third maybe, uh, chose to remain in Kharkiv. And as I speak to you right now, they're in Kharkiv. Uh, and uh, they are resisting the enemy in the, in, in the more direct ways. While those of us who chose to leave Kharkiv are continuing to... Uh, to to create to to talk to um, to make exhibitions to try to resist through art uh, resist on the cultural front as much as we can uh, because our art is in danger and we will protect it till the end um, so yeah this is um, the story of residence in Slovo and uh, apartment of Yuri Shevelov and the house of Slovo in a nutshell. And uh, I'll probably pass it on to Jonathan. And if you have any questions with regard to what I've been just talking about, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Mikola. Um, wonderful. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I feel like that's the, 
that's really the the message of of, of this evening. Um, I'll now talk very very briefly about my own experience in the residency. Um, I think that since you know when we made this film and when I was a resident there, we could never have imagined that the situation would turn out the way it has. Um, and so I think it's important as well that um, we get a glimpse of of what of what Kharkiv was like before the invasion. You know, everyone knows about Kharkiv now on the news um, and they imagine it as a victim of Russian aggression as shelled out twisted metal and destroyed apartment blocks. But I think that, you know, this isn't the Kharkiv that Mikola grew up with. It's not the Kharkiv that I got to experience very briefly when I was there. So I thought I'd just take a moment now to take you back in time, back before the 24th of February, uh, and to talk to you a little bit about the Kharkiv that I grew to love, the Kharkiv that I was fortunate enough to get a small glimpse of. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I was, I was um, the, the way that this whole thing came into being is because Mikla and I met at the Ecole Jacques Lecoq in Paris when we were both studying there. He told me about the residency and he encouraged me to apply. And I decided for one reason or another to do a um, documentary film about architecture. Um, I was interested in the complicated legacy that Soviet structures might have in what was then a free and independent Ukraine. Um, as, as we now know all too well, you, Kharkiv is situated at only 30 kilometers from the Russian border. And it's also, as Mikola mentioned, the former capital of Soviet Ukraine. Um, the legacy of this rule remains written in concrete across the cityscape. And so this Soviet architecture is sort of still present in a city which has, um, you know, deposed of this uh, former rule. Um, and, you know, the built environment has this patrimony of a defunct regime. And so I was asking myself, what should be done with these structures? Should they be preserved? Should they be destroyed? Or should they be repurposed? And what power do they hold over the way people think and interact with their environment? And so to begin with, uh, uh, we began this sort of analysis, Mikla and I together, um, at the Kharkiv School of Architecture, where we were fortunate enough to teach um, for, uh, for a week or so. Um, you can see our students here. And uh, what we did is we put forward a an approach to architecture through movement, which allows architects to work on a scale of one, one. So they were confronted with the real sensations of a body in a space. And it's that sensation, which was the starting point for construction. Uh, rather than extrapolating sensation from a maquette, we experimented with inverting this process, beginning with sensation and then transposing that onto a maquette. This was a technique that we both learnt uh, at the LEM, the Laboratoire d'Etudes du Mouvement, um, at Le Col de Jacques Lecoq, and was the starting point for this project as well. Um, I think it's worth sort of mentioning here, as we're looking at this image, um, that one of our students, unfortunately, has been killed um, very recently. Um, it's a very, very difficult feeling to, to know that, um, but I think it's good to say his name, and his name was Zahari, and he's the one on the on the far, is that left? Um, the one next yeah, to you, far left. Um, so I think it's worth just noting that that is a, a thing which is going on. Um, so yeah, we, we, we fought at the School of Architecture and um, this experience, uh, I guess, really encouraged me to bring on a new form of analysis into the process. Um, I decided that the, inter that the film should not just include a series of interviews um, about these questions, but also a movement element. Um, that, uh, you know, explored more our living relationship to our built environment. So it wasn't just an analyzing um, this architecture through interview, but also through movement. And it was here really that the choreographic process began. Um, now, I thought I'd just give you a little bit of an insight into what it was like to actually make this work in the residency. Now, the residency provides you with an unbelievable amount of, 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 of opportunities. And coming to Kharkiv back then, you know, I was struck by how, um, by the amount of cultural output in the city. Nearly everyone that I met made some kind of art, whether it be poetry, pottery, performance. Um, and initiatives like the Slova Residency, like Theatre Neft, or even the Kharkiv School of Architecture, had a sort of powerful and grounded, passionate approach to their art forms. 
Um, I got the sense as Nicola was talking about that resistance existed not just on the border, but also on the cultural, in the cultural sphere. Um, one of the key, just to give you an insight into this, one of the key um, elements of the residency is this idea of the kvartirnik. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> the kvartirnik or the apartment party um, was a opportunity or and also kind of a mandatory part of the residency where you're uh, told that you should present your work um, to a live public in the middle of the creation of it. And I feel like in the UK, at least, when it comes to creation, we're quite guarded and quite sort of, uh, we're quite, I don't know, we're, we're guarded about our creative processes. Well, here, you're encouraged to lay them out in the open, open for criticism and for critique and for construction. Um, and I found that such a remarkably uh, new approach. Um, it not only makes yourself honest about where you are in the process and also about what work you're creating, but it gives you this opportunity to network. And it was through, um, you know, Kvartinik such as these that I met many of the interviewee, interviewees. Here you can see Jura who ended up in the film. Uh, and I also met um, many other people who gave us opportunities such as at Paradfest uh, where we later screened the film. Um, yeah, and it, I guess it's just a really remarkable example of the kind of cultural, uh, grounded cultural nature that existed in the city at the time. Um, here you can see some, some images of us creating the, uh, the film. And um, indeed it was a quotation such as these, which led us to be able to screen it uh, in front of Derish Prom in this extraordinary outdoor screening as part of Paradfest. Um, so yeah, as I said, without, I, I'm unable to show you the film now, However, one sort of meager um, thing that I can show is the trailer of the film, which I'd love to do now. Um, so if I just switch over to the trailer, hopefully this will work. Um, let me just check, I've got the sound on, yeah. So I'm delighted to present the trailer to you now. Oh. <laughs> Харьков вот такая и не одна реализованная утопия, да? Я не знаю, як називається юридична особа, яка володіє цією будівлею, але десь мій рот не втрачається. Ні, не можна. Ні. Ми ж в Україні живемо. Фантастик. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's a little insight into the film. Um, and uh, I guess it's worth saying that six months after we finished shooting, uh, the full-scale military invasion of Ukraine began, um, which has obviously taken us all off our feet and has meant that since the invasion, um, the impact on the film has been twofold. First of all, it serves as a kind of time capsule now, a snapshot of this time. Um, and it sort of captured um, the tensions that were embodied in social space right before the city descended into war. The second consequence is that we've now committed to using the film as a fundraising tool uh, in any way that we can. Uh, we've been fundraising for uh, Help Harkiv, uh, and uh, as Lucy mentioned in our introduction, we've held screenings in a few different venues, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But for now, I'll just let Mikola talk a little bit about um, the invasion itself uh, and the impact that it's had on the film and on the people within it. Um, so I'll just play this little video as well and let Mikola explain over some of the images. Yeah, so this is uh, right in front of Dashbrom, in fact. 
this building is uh, a city council, right? Would you call it? Yeah. Um, this is also a city center. This is not far from that city city council. I would say that's probably like a kilometer. Um, that's also a city center. So yeah, this the 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 city was damaged pretty badly in the first um, well the first month uh, or so. It was really under heavy bombardment, uh, not only by artillery but also by planes and. Um, um, many of my friends r remain in Kharkiv today, so I have tons of different stories. Right now, you can see the metro, for instance. So the first place where people started evacuating was uh, if they were unable to evacuate the city, they were all going to the metro. Because the Soviet metro, uh, by the... Uh, uh, no, it, it, it's a bit absurd, but the Soviet metro saved many lives. Uh, and is still staying. There are still so many people living in the metro uh, who are afraid to go out. And although we have this news of um, so-called liberation of Kharkiv or uh, the positions that were occupied by Russians, that were taken by Russians near the city and were enabling them to, to keep on shelling the city every day, they were cleared by Ukrainian forces uh, literally last week. Um, however, the danger is remaining because the city is very close to the Russian border, as Jonathan mentioned, it's 30 kilometers away. Um, and we never know how the situation is going to turn, like, to, 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 where it's going to turn, what turn it's going to take. Uh, so the first phase of war was really, what well, the first week was extremely tough because no one really knew what's going on and how we're going to hold up. Um, but once we stood that, uh, once, once it was clear that we won the first week, then the, the first phase began, which lasted for technically two months uh, or a month and a half. I'm not a military expert, so I'm just saying, I'm just sharing my uh, view of, of the situation. Um, and now we have won the first phase of war, so the Rus Russians can no longer uh, get near Kiev, can no longer uh, attempt to occupy uh, cities like Kharkiv, because we are uh, Kharkiv is technically un, 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 untakeable right now. It's it has uh, the level the level with which people are ready to defend Kharkiv right now is unseen. Uh, however, the danger remains, and um, uh, there are still places like Mariupol, uh, which which are just unthinkable of in 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 twenty first century when. Uh, nearly 500 civilians were were locked at, at the factory for two months and with no food, with no water, with no access to medicine. And they were saved uh, a few weeks ago, but the military still remained there in, in that same factory and they are dying of wounds uh, simply because they don't have banal, uh, like elementary uh, medication, antibiotics. Um, and... As you know, all the Ukrainians are, are demanding and are asking for extraction of, of, of our surrounded um, military in Mariupol because otherwise it's a question of days for them to, um, to die, unfortunately. Uh, so I'm doing that with my message as well right now. And by, if you don't know what Mariupol is, just Google it. And uh, yeah, maybe I can just use this chance as well to sort of to, to transmit a message uh, that if, if, you, if, you, if you don't understand something that I'm saying, or if you're not familiar with some of the names of the cities or events, then one of the best things that you can do to help us is Google it. Just be aware, just talk about it, just be curious. Um, yeah, um, I don't know what else to add. Uh, this is my girlfriend on the screen. <laughs> she is yeah. also in the film. Uh, Masha, this is also city center. And she's um, now, um, yeah, helping document war crimes. Um, yeah, she's she's working for the largest human rights organization, and she spent the last month and a half in Dnipro, which is uh, also uh, a large city, but much further to the east than Lviv. And uh, uh, she was working for Mar she was working uh, uh, in um, talking to people from Mariupol who evacuated Mariupol, who made decisions, who were witnesses of war crimes. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I guess yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll probably just um, leave it there. Uh, the last thing to say is just that we'd love any donations that uh, you can. Uh, here you can see uh, Vakio Harkiv, which, as Lucy mentioned, is a group of volunteers led by Igor Kluchnik, who performs in the film, um, to evacuate and help provide aid uh, to the citizens of Kharkiv. You can see some of their work on the screen now. Um, and yeah, if you'd like to support, please do donate. Um, and if you'd like to come along, if you're based in London, you'd like to come along to a screening of the film. Uh, as I said, the next one will be in KCL, where you'll also have a chance to donate. Um, but yeah, I guess uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, uh, Mikola, in a, for joining us. Um, all the thank way you, from... Jonathan, for making it all possible. And thank you, Lucy, as well, you, Lucy, for making well. it all possible. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you both so very much. That was um, that was so deeply insightful and moving. And uh, I guess, you know, we are also um, honoring the memory of your student who passed away tragically in the, these, uh, these um, uh, hideous circumstances. Um, I was very moved by, by everything that you've both told me, and it's clearly a very personal project. Um, you're, you know, you're very firm friends. You're uh, Mikola's girlfriend is working for the human rights organization has um, played a key role in the project. Um, and you've made the point so crystal clear. And um, Mikola, when you say hockey is untakeable, let's yeah. also pray and hope that it's unshakable as well, because um, I was thinking uh, of my own journey uh, of, of trips and work that I've done in, in places like uh, Riga in Latvia, which has its own history of um, uh, Soviet Union domination over at different successive periods of time. And, uh, um, and then finally uh, wrestled free, but it's, you know, the, the traces are so obvious in the city's architecture. Mm. And, uh, and then also in a different way, again, uh, Tallinn in Estonia. Um, both cities that I have had the pleasure to work in. So um, there are a few uh, questions I'm curious about. So I hear that that in the period uh, 2014 to 22, following the Euro Maiden protests, Ukraine experienced a major cultural revi- revival. Uh, what were what were some of the key reasons for that? And uh, at the same time, Hakif was uh, on a journey to rediscover its magnificent architectural and literary agency, agent, uh, legacy and building its agency. So uh, if you could just briefly tell us uh, some of the reasons what, that uh, propelled this, this uh, shift. It's really so, so interesting to hear that the last decade has been up until uh, the, the current events but also working continuously in, in transcending and in spite of them. I mean, Kharkiv is such a very creative city inherently, it seems. Uh, am I right in thinking that you were asking about uh, the reasons behind the Euromaidan revolution or the reasons behind that uh, sort of well, period the, of development that so, followed so it? it? Clearly, so uh, it clearly that those activities and events clearly helped to propel um, well, there were major cultural revival after mm-hmm. that point. So, if you could just uh, briefly tell us, um, so how how did that? Uh, what were some of the drivers, and how did that manifest itself? And similarly, Haki mm-hmm. as a city also uh, actively, proactively rediscovering its le- its cultural legacy. Yeah, well, I think uh, to begin with. Uh... To, uh, to me personally, I'm, uh, I was born in independent Ukraine mm-hmm. uh, and there are millions of me like me right now. And this is not, this is, this was not, uh, we were living in a different Ukraine when there were very few of us, but now uh, the majority of people who are, uh, I think, who are moving Ukraine towards Europe, towards uh, these values that we are fighting for, are young population, young generation, generation of those people who are, who realize that they are living in their country and uh, they have no uh, sort of sentiment for Soviet Union. Uh, and 
And I think that um, it's important to mention as well that Ukraine uh, was always was always trying to get rid of this uh, of this. Uh, 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 I don't even know how to, to, to call this, but like this disease of Russian attempt to make it sort of one thing when it's not. Hmm. And we can see that in the history of 1991, for instance, when uh, when there was a, a clear decision made of, of Ukrainians to, to separate, to, to be an independent state, and then followed by a revolution of orange, so-called orange revolution in 2004, when uh, uh, as well, uh, there was a, a present election after which majority of people uh, who witnessed on um, what would you call this uh, unfair uh, uh, move, moves from certain politicians. They just made a revolution. They were like, no, that's not how we want to leave. That's not cool with us. So we will we'll go out. We will go on the streets and we will, we will stand there for as long as needed. So it's, I think... Uh, it was a sequence of events that brought to 2014, and uh, but then uh, we couldn't use our chance to um, to develop, I guess, as fast as we wanted. So we brought it to the case where Russia took over again with their own puppet uh, president, uh, Viktor Yanukovych. Um, he took over in 2009, if I if I'm not mistaken. Uh, or 2010 uh, and uh, 2013 was a year when uh, he was uh, he was very repressing and uh, uh, Ukraine was literally just uh, uh, it was dragged more and more towards towards Russian uh, control uh, and all of a sudden again people people just were not okay with it and they were not they were many of us who were not okay with it, many enough in order to go out and protest. Uh, and even though it was very, it was very hard to predict what's going to happen. Uh, and as you know, in 2013 revolution, um, many people were shot as well on the streets mm -hmm. by, 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 by uh, police. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was very um, tense. It was not some kind of just shouting out for a better future for Ukraine. It was a technically a, 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 a very radical, um, a very radical resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Russia used that in order to to take to, to occupy uh, Crimea and to uh, invade Donbas, to invade Donetsk, to to invade Lugansk. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to uh, to do the same with Kharkiv, and they were mm -hmm. trying to call it uh, a civil war, mm -hmm. and they still do. If you if you hear at any point in time, this is a civil war. This is again a, a part of Russian propaganda trying to make it um, to make it seem that they are not a part of it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so to answer your question, I just think that this is important to understand that this is not some kind of uh, event that had no. Uh, three stages to it. So it was a, a sequence of events that, that brought to 2013 with, with generations growing through these events, with me participating in 2004 revolution when I was seven years old, uh, with my dad uh, by my side, singing the songs that I still remember. This, this is what makes us Ukrainians right now, is that we, were, we, we, were, we, grew, we grew up in this resistance to Russia. This is not something incredibly new to us. To, to many in Europe, the war began on 24th of February. And sometimes people say, uh, okay, well, how your life changed after the war? Well, I mean, for us, the war began in 2014. It's been going on for, for eight years. The only reason is that right now it's uh, technically the majority of the, uh, of the territory of Ukraine and the whole world talks about. It. That's the only difference. Yeah, so uh, the, the authenticity, the legitimacy of your cultural authenticity is something that you have all so bravely held on to resolutely without um, missing a step at any, any point. And uh, it's a spirit, isn't it? It's absolutely, fundamentally it's spirit that you carry with you. And exactly. What is so um, 
so poignant and so engaging about the film as one of the many reasons why it's engaging uh, is that it, because it's so many stories intersected with each other, but um, you're using dance and choreography to, uh, to engage in a, in a physical, psychological way with, the, with the, those particular spaces um, that have so many histories, social, cultural, uh, autobiographical histories attached to them. And uh, was that something that because you both, you, you were studying at the Ecole, was that something, the inclusion of dance and uh, choreography, was that something that came very quickly to you? as part of the creative evolution of the project? Uh, I suppose so. I mean, Nicola and I, of course, had that history. Um, but we know when I came to Ukraine, it was clear to me making this film that the voices in the film and the everyone who you see in the film uh, should be Ukrainian um, and that my voice shouldn't be heard at all. Mm. Um, and so it was for that reason, really, that we embarked on a very collaborative choreographic process. Um, as you rightly pointed out, Lucy, you know, a lot of this was about the autobiography of the, of the participants. Um, mm -hmm. Mikola and Igor uh, were dancing not only the building, but also to a certain extent, I think, their lived experience with it. A lot of the buildings in the film are in the city mm -hmm. centre. And so it's, um, it's buildings which they would have uh, come across many, many times. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was kind of the idea behind the, the choreography and behind the film as a whole. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. Can I, yeah, I can add maybe that, uh, in fact, I grew up and I spent my entire youth uh, between Dersprom and House of Slovo. <laughs> uh, so on my, technically on my left, um, 500 meters from me was Dersprom and on my right, 150 meters, it was House of Slovo. And uh, I spent many years uh, going to House of Slovo to one of the uh, one of the great daughters of of one of the writers to study math because she was a math teacher, and I didn't even know that this is House of Slovo. I just went to do math, and then many years after I realized that um, that, that yeah that I'm just living near this incredible heritage, and uh, I spent my entire I spent literally like six years going there like every other morning. Mm -hmm. um, to do to do classes, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so another very important question is: Did uh, getting so close, you know, you grew up between uh, Deshprom and House of Slovo, and the particular history of the House of Slovo and the 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 co uh, co living concept of people working in such close uh, closely integrated environments, but having their separate spaces and having all mod cons, well. A telephone that at least if you think about it today that kind of living lifestyle pattern supported by architecture it is actually really popular now in uh, Berlin in uh, Zurich ba uh, Barcelona uh, other German cities here in the UK it's a bit of a growing movement do you personally feel um, that are people starting to think about new ways in which they'd like to live when they finally get uh, get more of their lives back I mean this is not a conversation you're going to be having too much further down the line I mean it's survival and thriving at the same time isn't it no you're right uh, in fact it's very important to think about these things right now and we do have a lot of argument in our society in Lviv right now as for instance Harkiv School of Architecture moved from Harkiv to Lviv it's still called Harkiv School of Architecture yet they function mm -hmm. in Lviv and they, uh, they do not stop doing that. They do not all take up arms because they do realize that partially we should, one of the challenges of war is to understand what role you should take. Mm. Uh, because not all of us will be efficient with, with arms. In fact, some of us will be only, uh, will be working the other direction. They will, like, you, you, will, you will make the army less efficient if you, if you join the army in a way. So mm. it's very, it's tricky. It's also tricky to, to make it peace with yourself when you realize that you're, you're a guy of 25 years old, for instance, what you should do, should you join the army or not. But I, I'm a strong believer, uh, and every day I'm, I'm, sort of, I'm still having these challenges, I'm still having this question to myself, but I'm trying to make a choice in favor of 
uh, efficiency and productivity. And I understand that this sort of topics, this sort of questions that you're asking are extremely important. Uh, so um, Oleg Drozdov, who you also might have seen in the trailer, he is, uh, uh, he is one of the key uh, persona who runs this uh, conversation about what to do next, how to, how, what is our model, what is our strategy for rebuilding Kharkiv, for rebuilding mm -hmm. Ukraine, for rebuilding Mariupol. Um, this is a great challenge because it's not just, we're not talking about streets, we're talking about Mariupol is literally destroyed to technically to zero. So what is it? How is it? It's an incredible uh, opportunity, uh, which can be so easily uh, missed out, or um, um, yeah, or or just or just. So so this is this is a starting point for a new Ukraine to appear, and what this new Ukraine is going to be depends in in many like in many ways. It depends on those who do not hold arms right now. So the responsibility lies on. On people who do who do culture, uh, who do architecture, mm -hmm. who do theater, who do um, yeah, who, who who think about these things, who can think about these things because others are are dying for them. Um, but I do not have an answer. Obviously, what I can certainly tell that is that, uh, as I heard in a conversation with Oleg uh, when we we had a conversation the other day, he said we should not be misled by an idea that once the war is over, once we win the war, that we are going to st to live a beautiful life. Because what's going to happen is that once we win the war, the new one will begin. And this one will be between us. Uh, it, it will be between our ideas, between our uh, imagination of what new Ukraine should look like. Uh, this will be a huge challenge. And mm. I think uh, very, very often I'm trying to, to not let myself in thinking that this is not uh, something I should be thinking about right now or we should be thinking about right now. So I, I'm pretty sure that this is a challenge of tomorrow. This is a challenge of today in order to have mm. to be prepared for tomorrow, because when tomorrow comes and we're not prepared and we have no plan, mm -hmm. we're doomed. And this is another thing that Ukraine is often is, is often guilty of as we as a society is that we are so good at, 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 at uh, uh, connecting and uh, 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 fighting together. Uh, the, the unity of, of all of us on 25th of February was just unseen. And we do win those wars, we do win those revolutions. Mm -hmm. And then we don't know what to do with that. Uh, so I, I truly believe that we should, this, this time we should not uh, let it, uh, pass this opportunity yeah thank you thanks very much uh, Mikola you um you spelled it out so succinctly that it's really incumbent on uh, all, all leaders in the society uh, whether they're cultural and planning leaders mayors for example to work in very parallel flat management together with the people uh, whether whatever walk of life to uh, to to uh, to take those decisive steps forward. Um, I mean, I know you know a lot of your leaders have got their work totally cut out, um, working in other respects on on survival humanitarian issues. But at the same time, you know, I think what you say is so fundamentally f sound and and correct. Um, so. Hakiv is unshakable. I, uh, we will have to close now because uh, we have come to the end of the questions and uh, the audience has um, not so far raised any questions, but this is quite common when we have such a, a comprehensive and engaging talk that they, they like sometimes to listen to what everyone <laughs> has, to, has to say. So... Um, I thank you both very much for your time. And I would so finish off with two, uh, three things actually, no, four things actually. So <laughs> very much uh, hugely grateful to both of you for uh, coming coming on and telling us this uh, incredible story and uh, poignant and uh, um, story that makes us think and reflect and uh, hopefully look up all those words on Google that we may or may not already know. 
Um, I want to repeat the, the re request that we've made earlier to uh, for any members of the audience who uh, wish to support the two charities, so help Kharkiv, the group of volunteers providing humanitarian aid and evacuating, helping to evacuate citizens from Kharkiv, where the film was shot. And uh, secondly, and in tandem with that, donations to Kharkiv residency Slovo that uh, Jonathan and Mikola have discussed and presented in order to support the funding for the cross-cultural team to resume work there when it, as soon as it's safe. Um, so we've shown the, um, the ways in which you can do that. Uh, if you look on the chat, you can see the two. Let me just see if I can get them up here and repeat them to you. Ah, uh, yeah, we have, so it's um, um, HTTPS um, colon, double forward slash www.patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash. Um, and then there's, a, um, then there's a Ukrainian word. Is that an L or an I? That's an L. L, yeah. So L for Lima, I, T for Tango, R, E, Z, Slovo, S for Sugar, L, O, V for Victor, O. And then the other one is the same uh, H-T-T-P-S, colon double forward slash evacuate Kharkiv, which is k-h-a-r-k-i-v dot org forward slash. Um, so we um, we don't have a graphic to put forward to you about that. So that in the absence of that one right now that I'm going to tell you that and hopefully you can support. So other reminder to um, if you live in London or you're planning to come to London in, at the end of May, very much consider to sign up King's Cross, uh, sorry, not King's Cross, <laughs> King's uh, College London, uh, that's KCL, down on the Strand. Um, 30th of May is when the film will be screened again and Jonathan will be there. And will you have another guest? You, will Mikola be there or you have other guests in, in residence there? Uh, I don't think we do. Igor and Mikola, I think, are zooming yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think we are, yeah. Yeah, 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 as far as I can remember. So, fantastic. It was... so it's an even bigger lineup than we have today. <laughs> so it's going to be a fantastic opportunity. I will um, do my utmost to be there myself. So thank you very much uh, indeed. I've got one more um, finish off. Um, uh, we always uh, tell the audience just briefly what we have next coming up online. It's also on the 30th of May. Ah. <laughs> we do have more than one chair. It's public offerings anticipating the 2022 London Festival of Architecture theme of action and activism with Yemi Aladaram, who's an architect, the rising star architect, moreover, and development manager of Meridian Water, the big mixed use uh, development scheme uh, up, uh, up in Upper Edmonton in Northeast London, which is being uh, the master developer of that is Enfield Council. And she'll be talking about her civic engagement, which is engendering positive change through collaboration, partnership, housing delivery, inclusion and representation in the construction industry. We have just fixed that date. It will be announced Yay! with sign up details on our website and via social media on Thursday of this week. So watch those spaces. Right, I've done all four of those. So <laughs> once again, thank you so much. And uh, um, Jonathan and Mikola, it's been a real pleasure and um, very best of luck and we'll see you again so soon. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Lucy. <laughs> Thanks a lot.